Our next speaker is Trey Eidecker. Uh, Trey Eidecker is professor of medicine at UCSD. He's director of the National Resource for Network Biology he, and the director of the San Diego Center for Systems Biology. He's also adjunct professor of computer science and bioengineering at UCSD and a member of um, the Moore's UCSD Cancer Center. Uh, Trey is truly a pioneer using genome scale measurements to construct uh, network models of cellular processes and disease, and his goal is to develop new, a new type of medicine based on knowledge of complete physical and functional wiring of cells. His laboratory is developing new ways of mapping these wiring diagrams directly from genomic, proteomic, and metabolomic data, and using these maps to translate uh, the increasingly complex data generated from patients to predict disease outcomes and better develop treatments. So please join me in welcome Trey Eidecker to the stage. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sylvia. It's a real pleasure to be here at this conference. If you look at where a lot of the talks that we've seen here are angling towards, a lot of them are angling towards this idea of a biomedically intelligent agent like a Siri. But importantly, beyond asking this Siri of the cell, so to speak, questions like what sushi restaurant I should eat at tonight after my talk in Palo Alto, you would ask her questions like, Siri, my patient has these mutations and, and maybe these two genes, maybe it's an entire mutation profile. What patient phenotypes should I expect? And you'd actually get, get real answers that you could trust. And those would be answers about diagnosis, prognosis, and ultimately uh, patient treatment. So this kind of question that we're all really angling towards is one of many types of questions that fall under this general aegis of the genotype to phenotype association problem. That's, as, as you know, long been a core question in genetics and, and biomedicine as well. It, since, or it seeks to bridge changes in genes or mutations, which you could roughly say are at the scale of nanometers or sub-nanometer, to changes in patient states at the scale of coarsely graining at meters. And that nine orders of magnitude gap there is, is really what causes, as we know, a very, very hard uh, problem. In particular, the challenges are, are twofold, and these are major challenges. So one is what's been referred to as the extreme heterogeneity in patient populations, the idea that every patient is a snowflake. The second is that, as we've heard several times at this conference already, Almost all present machine learning and statistical approaches for associating genotype to phenotype, and uh, indeed any association we wish to make with machine learning, is done so with a black box. It's inscrutable. You can't get in there and look at the wiring or in, in biology what we call mechanistic interpretation. That may be good enough in some domains, like for instance, uh, uh, getting Netflix to recommend what movie you should watch later tonight. But in biology and medicine, it's absolutely required not just to make accurate predictions, but to couple those predictions to biological underlying mechanisms, ultimately so you can drug those. So just to kind of give a quick slide on, on this challenge of heterogeneity, here's a set of 351 patients with ovarian cancer. Their tumors were re uh, uh, resected by the Cancer Genome Atlas Project and the gene sequence to reveal mutations. This uh, plot zooms in on chromosome 17 at the gene resolution. So a point in this plot shows that that patient had a mutation in the gene along that x-axis. The vertical blue line is not because I drew a blue line in PowerPoint, although it certainly looks that way. That's because gene 170 or so on, on chromosome 17 is the infamous gene P53. And P53 is indeed commonly mutated in this cohort and lots of cancer cohorts. It's mutant in nearly every patient in, in this ovarian tumor cohort. However, other than that one mutated gene, Neither human eyes nor machines have managed to find much patterns in these data, although almost certainly some of these mutations are drivers of cancer. So that's, that's the challenge. Now, as a general meme as of late in the past couple of years for how cancer gen genomicists, geneticists are trying to grapple with this problem, and also for other diseases, as you've heard from Laszlo, 
is, is this idea that's a powerful idea that this heterogeneity converges on common networks in the cell. So here's a, uh, a publication, one of many publications I could have chosen from, uh, this is head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, again, another sequenced patient cohort, where the authors of this paper have essentially divided the world into five pathways shown as columns across this slide. You have a kinase, uh, a set of pathways at, at uh, at far left, cell death, immunity differentiation pathways, and so on. The point they're making here is that individual gene mutations are seen rarely. One in a patient here, another gene mutated in some other patient here. But these patients look much more similar at these pathway levels where a high percentage of patients are mutated somewhere in some gene in, in one of those pathways. So based on this powerful idea, this uh, gets back to the genotype-phenotype uh, uh, problem and suggests a following general strategy. So rather than directly associate nanometer scale events to meter scale events, what we need to do is fill in these middle layers, just like you heard in Laszlo's talk. So number one is systematically mapping of those networks pathways, and indeed, all of the structure and function ultimately that you'd need to connect the nanometer scale to the meter scale. And then having done that, challenge two becomes to advance computer science to the point that it's not building black box machine learning models, but it's visible machine learning models that rest on top of these exquisite hierarchies of, of biological systems. So that's been the general strategy behind our recent NCI grant that uh, Silvio talked about uh, for uh, this Cancer Center for Systems Biology mechanism. We called this the Cancer Cell Map Initiative. And I'll get to a lot of what's on this slide really for the remainder of my talk. But first, just to introduce the players, uh, we exploited here in the initial grant, although we've already expanded outside of these, these faces, um, a north-south access uh, uh, point in the University of California system but the real point here is a diversity of talent that's been assembled. So you have everything from basic cell uh, cancer biology here represented to expertise in structural proteomics and protein-protein interaction mapping to computational biology to, to clinical connections. And, and that's the importance of, of a large collaboration like this and shows the importance of growing it. So for instance, um, to, to start to map this middle layer of detail that we need between genotype and phenotype in cancer. Nevin Krogan's lab at UC San Francisco is a world expert in using this technique called affinity, purifi uh, affinity purification tandem S spectrometry to map protein-protein interactions. You already heard a bit about this from Laszlo, so I can, I can be brief. Here, uh, each of these yellow uh, nodes is a protein that's mutated in, in cancer patients, and Nevin's begun to flesh out what are the direct physical interactors of other proteins in the human cell with those. Nearly all of it is, is, is new knowledge, uh, is, is the upshot. The second kind of network that you'd like to map out is the so-called gene-gene or gene-drug interaction landscape. So rather than just physical connections between gene products, these are combinations of mutations in cancer and drugs that produce unlikely and surprising phenotypes like proliferation. So you're very interested in combinations of mutations that arise during evolution to cause your cancer, that is to say this increase in proliferation. Uh, but you're also as interested in combinations of mutations and drugs that kill those cancer cells and result in a uh, synthetic lethal uh, effect, it's been called. So, so those uh, are, are important networks to map out as well. But now let me turn to how we're beginning to use these network data to construct cancer cell models, and uh, uh, especially with regard to these hierarchies. Now, in a short talk like this, I'm going to essentially gloss over all of it, other than to show you a pretty picture that's the outcome. But just suffice it to say, advances in bioinformatics clustering algorithms, that's all they are, um, just so, you know, sophisticated clustering algorithms can find proteins whose uh, uh, interactions nest them test, uh, tightly together, and those then are placed inside of larger nested groups, inside of larger nested clusters, and so on. And all together, you can extract from that structure a hierarchy, which begins to redefine the hierarchy of subsystems that's in a cell. Our first foray at this was back in 2013. This is the, this flower-like image is what you see from that. And this is not a cancer cell, it's a yeast. 
Uh, and why do people use uh, uh, budding yeast? Because it's a wonderful model and a lot of data for engaging in, the, in, in these kinds of problems early on. But at the center of this flower, you see uh, the, the, the central node that's labeled root, represents the whole cell, and then the data start to factor the cell apart into the mitochondrion, the membrane, the intracellular compartment, and all of its subcompartments and processes. Up at the right-hand corner in panel B, zooming all the way down to, to uh, the base of this hierarchy, you can see many protein complexes there. Uh, so here's what the proteasome looks like, uh, uh, which is a protein complex important for uh, protein degradation. And you see that that factors into a core and a regulatory particle and their subunits and so on and so forth. And keep in mind, all of this structure can be inferred from protein uh, interaction networks like, like is shown down there in panel C. So that's the structure. Now, what about the function? So this gets back to the, the deep neural networks idea. So now that we're beginning to flesh out the structure, can we develop computer learning algorithms that can seed that structure as part of the learning and therefore not be black boxes, but be transparent, visible uh, uh, machines? And the simple idea here is to take that hierarchy, which for yeast, if you saw on the previous slide, is quite large. It's got about 3,500 subsystems uh, incorporated in it. And for each of those subsystems, assign a bank of neurons. And that neuron bank represents the state of that subsystem. So for instance, one of those many uh, processes is shown here on the right, that's DNA repair. And the state of DNA repair will have its neurons in that neural network that represent that. And the, uh, those neurons are updated only from the neurons of the subsystems which make up DNA repair. So three well-known processes that you also uh, rediscover in protein networks uh, that make up DNA repair are double-stranded break repair, base excision repair, and mismatch repair, and there are others. Uh, and so you can see that the wiring of the neural network is exactly set to respect this hierarchy of biological systems. Now, those are four subsystems out of 3,500, and the entire structure, uh, 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 input-output relationship here is to take genotypic changes or mutations at the top and translate those into phenotypic outcomes, uh, which we, uh, here we started with cell proliferation. Uh, again, another great reason to benchmark this in budding yeast is because the community now has access to over 12 million such genotypes and, and proliferation assays. It's quite remarkable. Here's the prediction capability of that system. Oh, and I should say it's also a nice coincidence that the size of this model over those many subsystems and neurons per subsystem and the depth of the biological system is about 12 layers, which is very, very equivalent to some of the deep learning systems you see in other domains like AlphaGo. It's about the same size. It's, it's pretty interesting how, that, how it turns out. So here's the, the growth prediction over all those genotypes, uh, shown in two ways. One is the correlation of uh, predicted uh, uh, growth versus measured. Uh, uh, if you want a single bar, uh, here you, you can look at the correlation in blue as being 0.5. And to calibrate that, you can observe that uh, simply your ability to reproduce the same experiment is, is, is about 60% correlation. So that's about as good as you're ever going to do uh, just due to experimental error. Now, importantly, this is a visible model, so you can open up the hood and start to explain the reasons for each of these predictions. And so uh, here's a genotype that involved deletion or mutation of two genes, RXT3 and SWC5, and the uh, prediction and observation was death of the cells. Now, the explanation the machine makes is shown there between the two, and essentially the upshot is, RXT3 encodes part of a SYN3 type uh, 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 complex, and SWC5 part of SWERV1, and those logically integrated nuclear chromatin whose state is essentially a logical or of its children. And that's the reason you, you get that prediction. All right, so I'm out of time. In, in summary, let me leave you with this uh, very dated, but as I'll explain, futuristic image. So if, if uh, back in the 50s you went into any hobby store, you could see on the shelf there, there was a, a, a V8 engine block called the Visible V8 model. And the idea of the Visible V8 was it, it not only simulated the, the output of an engine, which is to turn a crankshaft, but the turning of that crankshaft was accurately simulated by all of the internal parts, which could be seen because the thing was transparent. Okay. Now, uh, that 
dated image, and you can, <laughs> that's not the only way this, this image is dated, uh, 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 nonetheless has a surprisingly modern message uh, for us in this audience, which is we've got to dispense with these black box machine learning models for biomedicine and enforce some transparency to the underlying cell and tissue biology that we all know and love. We've just got to do it. And in so doing, maybe at that point we can update this and make it a more modern image that's of interest to many of us. So with that, uh, thank you very much.